Hey folks, I'm Chris Brenton, and today I want to give you a little excerpt on our Network Threat Hunter training class. Uh, this is our level one class, this is our intro class. You know, today, threat hunting is becoming one of our most important security disciplines. Uh, that's because it's our primary method of identifying when the bad guys have made it past our level of defenses and they're on our network. There's a lot of bad information out there. Um, I think from both, it's coming from both folks who want their older skill sets to be relevant. Uh, as well as vendors who want to just rebrand their products. Uh, threat hunting is a fairly new discipline. It's only been around for a couple of years now, uh, which is why we decided we wanted to create this free threat hunting class. Uh, it's a six hour class. It's about half lecture, you know, get you up to speed. And then hands on, uh, half of it is hands on labs to give you a chance to actually do some threat hunting. Uh, but I wanted to give you a little excerpt on the class. Let's just jump right into that. So one of the big questions is always, are we getting better at catching the bad guys all our on our network? Because there are some studies out there that seem to indicate that maybe we are. We used to run about six months, and over half the time, it was an outside third party that would figure out we were compromised. We'd never even figure it out for ourselves. And that number seems to be dropping. The problem is when you look at the studies that show that number is dropping, they've included uh, something new namely ransomware. One of the interesting things about ransomware is that'll get into your network. It'll run around for a couple of days and infect multiple systems, and then it will announce itself. Well, if it's announcing itself, let's say a week after it got into the network, people have been taking that as a, ooh, we detected it after a week. You, no, you didn't. <laughs> no, you did. That's like saying, hey, my TV got robbed. The robber showed up at my door the next morning and said, hey, I did it. Wow, isn't the police force in my town awesome? They're solving breaking and enterings within 12 hours. No, that, that completely ridiculous, right? The fact that the ransomware is identifying itself, that's skewing these numbers. One of the big tells for me is that the cost of recovery has not changed. In other words, if we had actually dropped from, let's say, six months down to like 30 days, which is what some of these studies are claiming, we should see a drop in the cost, right? It should cost less money to recover from being compromised if we're cutting, you know, five of those six months out of that whole process. And the reality is, no, it's costing us the same thing to recover, which to me says, yeah, we really haven't gotten better yet. Doesn't mean we can't, we just haven't yet. So the whole purpose of threat hunting is to close that gap as much as possible. You know, we have tools that are designed to keep the bad people out. Those are our protection tools. And we have tools that are designed to respond once we know the bad people are on the network. The challenge has been that middle area, right? How do we bridge those two? How do we very quickly figure out our layers of protections have failed? The attacker is on the network. We need to go into response mode. This is the, that, this is the spot where threat hunting fits. So this doesn't replace anything necessarily that we've done before. Uh, what it's designed to do is fill a vertical that quite honestly, we didn't have the tools or the processes or the speed to be able to go through and handle properly. Now, Historically, we've tried to do this based on central logging, right? And it makes a lot of sense for your central logging vendor and you're charging people based on the amount of data that gets stored. But for the rest of us, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because our central logging repository doesn't always collect everything, right? Our IoT devices don't collect there. A lot of times our network devices don't collect there. You know, maybe we've got a couple of Windows servers collecting there. We're certainly not collecting from every desktop. So it doesn't give us full visibility of our, of our environment, but the network does. If we simply monitor who's going to the internet and what they're doing, that gives us visibility of everything. You can have an IP-based camera plugged into your network that has no way to have a user agent installed. It doesn't support syslog. And monitoring its network traffic, you can figure out if it's been compromised or not. One of the really nice things about this is threat hunting becomes a very consistent process regardless of the platform. To take it another way, if I'm trying to do it based on centralized logs, the skills needed to figure out if a Windows system has been compromised are very different than the skills needed for a Cisco router or a Linux box. But when it's the network, everything's the same. You're looking for the same types of things. So what are you looking for? Typically with a threat hunt, one of the first things you want to go looking for is connection persistency. If a system gets compromised, that system's going to start calling out to a command and control server. It might do it based on long connections, it might do it based on beacons, but there's going to be some consistent conversation taking place between that compromised system and the command and control server that is controlling it. So if we start off looking for that, that's going to help us figure out which systems the systems have gone in and compromised. 
Now, not every persistent connection is going to be something that's evil. So when we find those persistent connections, the next thing we want to go in and look at is, can we find a business justified reason for this persistent connection to take place? For example, our Windows systems are checking for patches. Hey, that's good, right? We like that. Or all of our systems are using network time protocol to keep their time in sync. Hey, that's a good persistent connection. What we're worried about is, hey, five of our desktops are calling out to Kwanzu China every 30 seconds, and we don't have a field office there. We don't have a business partner there. We don't have a vendor there. There's no legitimate business reason to be calling to Kwanzu China. That's something we need to go in and investigate. Once we identify the connection persistency and we identify there's no obvious business need behind it, the next thing we want to look for is abnormal protocol behavior. Is there something weird going on? Does the user agent string not look right? Does the J3 hash of the SSL TLS handshake look odd compared to what that system usually does? We'll go in and we'll look at those types of things. After that, we may want to now do an investigation of that internal system. So if we're doing centralized logging, hey, this is where we can go in and kind of leverage that to get more information to figure out is our system in a compromised state or not. Once we've gone through these steps, now we can go through and disposition it. We can say, hey, we're pretty certain the system's compromised. We're going to have a bad week. Or, hey, no, that was just my Windows system calling out to see is there any, you know, Windows notification services or patches or whatever the case may be. It's good. We can now go in and add that to a safe list. So here's an example of the process I'm talking about. So if you look at that scale on the bottom, right, that is a time graph. It's identifying my x-axis, axis is time. Every bar represents one hour. My y-axis is quantity. It's describing the number of times each hour that this internal IP connected to that external IP over the course of a 24-hour period of time. And you can see every hour it's connecting about the same number of times. If we zoom in to look at how often each time delta was being seen, we get a little bell curve here, right? It's not doing it exactly every 30 seconds. It's varying the time interval a little bit. That's indicative of jitter attackers who do that to try and circumvent a lot of the threat hunting tools that are out there today. But if I see this and then I don't recognize where this is going and I don't recognize the host it's trying to connect to, now maybe I can jump into my host to see what's the binary that's responsible for making those connections. And if I can't understand why that binary is on that system, or if it's something like this, Runtime Broker. Runtime Broker is a Windows tool that is responsible for enforcing permissions on applications that you download from the Microsoft Store. Well, this thing was calling out to DigitalOcean. <laughs> There's no legitimate reason why Runtime Broker should be calling out to DigitalOcean. It should never happen. So this is a clear indication that, yeah, this is something we need to go in and pay attention to. So like I said, this is just a quick snippet of the class. Uh, hopefully you found it interesting. You should be able to go up and sign up for the next class that's available. We tend to run these every six weeks. We'll do one on the weekends for the, all those folks whose bosses won't let them take free training. And then we'll do another one during the week, uh, typically Tuesdays. So you can sign up whichever one works best for you. Hope to see you in the class.